Hey guys, Tom here from the Investing with Tom YouTube channel. Welcome back to the channel. If you enjoyed today's video, hit like, hit subscribe, and that way you can see future videos as well. Now, today's video is all about how value investors can take advantage of some of the inefficiencies in pricing in the stock market. And I'm gonna run you through some real life examples uh, of where price and value have obviously uh, varied off and investors have been able to take advantage of that and make really, really good returns. Now, before we get into that, we do have a sponsor for today's video and today's sponsor is Hatch. Uh, Hatch are the platform that I, as a New Zealander, use to purchase shares in the US, which is where a large percentage of my stock market portfolio sits. And I've been using Hatch for well over a year now. Um, the original reason that I switched across to Hatch is simply because of fees. I was spending 90 US dollars a trade with one of the banks. Um, those fees are down all the way at three US dollars. I could have done that same trade for now with Hatch. And over the period of time that I've been uh, with that particular platform, uh, they've continued to make improvements. So you can now integrate uh, Hatch with ShareSite, which is another one of the tools that I use for my investing. Uh, they've added in the ability to purchase fractional shares, which is really useful if you're investing smaller amounts of money. So it means that you can buy a partial share uh, so if you're looking at something like Google or Amazon or even something like Berkshire Hathaway Class A that trades at $300,000, um, you don't have to fork out a full $300,000 to buy a full share of Berkshire Hathaway. Um, with Hatch and the ability to buy fractional shares, you can literally put $100 or $1,000 uh, into one of those stocks where the per share price is quite high. So. Those are just some of the few really good things that Hatch has done to make uh, the investor's life easier here in New Zealand and give us better access to the US markets. And Hatch do have an offer for you today. So if you go to the link hatch.as forward slash investing with Tom and fund your account with 100 New Zealand dollars, Hatch will add an additional 20 New Zealand dollars into your account so that you can get started investing with a little bit more money. Now there's a prevailing theory out there in the stock market investing world called the efficient market hypothesis. And the efficient market hypothesis um, is something that Eugene Famer actually even got a Nobel Prize in economics for. Um, and it basically states that um, prices are equal to their values at all times. So if you're looking at one particular stock, um, efficient market hypothesis says that all the information possibly available will always be reflected in the price of that stock. It means that uh, stocks cannot get undervalued, they cannot get overvalued, uh, and basically the investor is wasting their time if they think that they can find undervalued or overvalued stocks and outperform the market. Um, it essentially says that that's not possible, um, and in order to get a high return, you must take more risk, um, and if you're making a lower return, it's probably because you're taking less risk. Um, there is an entire theory that I completely disagree with. <laughs> I think that over the long term, uh, markets price businesses in and around their intrinsic value or what they're fundamentally worth. Uh, but Warren Buffett is very famous for saying that he would be a bum on the street if, uh, if markets were efficient. And it's really the way that he's built his fortune is by looking for these inefficiencies. And Ben Graham, the father of value investing, um, also disagreed with this as well. So uh, you know, he had the saying that over the short term, the market is a voting machine and over the long term, the market is a weighing machine. In other words, um, short term stock prices are driven by investor sentiment. So if investors are really positive on a particular company or really negative on a particular company because they're looking at what that business might earn in the next quarter or the next year, that can be a big driver for stock prices. But over the long term, it's fundamentally what that business can return to its shareholders in terms of cash uh, that will drive the value long term of that business. So it allows investors to purchase undervalued stocks if they think they are truly undervalued um, because the market is doing all these crazy things in the short term. And over the long term, the market should eventually price that business uh, at its intrinsic value. Now, as much as I disagree with efficient market hypothesis um, and agree with Ben Graham and Warren Buffett, 
Uh, overall, the market is generally efficient most of the time. So it generally understands most businesses reasonably well and prices them reasonably appropriately. Um, but every now and then we have some absolute craziness and I want to basically just walk you through some real life examples of some times where the market has been very clearly wrong in its valuation of particular stocks um, and demonstrate some examples of when investors have had the opportunity to take advantage of that. So let's get straight into it. So our first two examples are going to be the most blatantly obvious um, examples of inefficiencies in markets. And the first one I have is actually quite a recent one. And this is simply investor confusion between uh, different stocks. So um, during this recent lockdown and quarantine period we've had uh, here in New Zealand and around the world, uh, there has been one particular business which has been doing extremely well compared to what they might have done um, if this whole thing never happened. And that company is Zoom. And one of the things that happened with Zoom is their stock price uh, during this period of time has gone up a lot. Uh, but one of the other unexpected things is that you have this other Zoom company with a very similar name and very similar uh, ticker symbol for when you're actually going to buy the stock. Uh, they have also had their price go up substantially. It's come down a little bit now. Um, and that other company makes mobile phone parts and really nothing changed in their business, yet their stock price went up more than Zoom. Now, um, this other company is a small cap company, so it doesn't. So it means that less dollars have to make this mistake for the price to to go up uh, a substantial amount. But I'll put up a chart on the screen here comparing the two, um, and it's just a very obvious uh, example of where markets can get things wrong. <laughs> and price things inefficiently. So, you know, if you were onto this very quickly, um, this would have been an incredible opportunity to short this other Zoom company because it has just been priced at a ridiculous price. Um, I don't short companies and a lot of value investors don't, but many of them do. And this would have been a great example of somewhere where you could do that. So um, that's our first example of a market inefficiency. I'm gonna put up a list of other stocks where basically the exact same thing has happened in the past. So I've made a video before on um, Ford, the Ford Motor Company versus Ford Industries. And Ford Industries has the ticker symbol F-O-R-D. Um, so we're often seeing the same thing there if the Ford Motor Company comes out with good news this other completely unrelated company called Ford Industries sees their stock price uh, move around a lot as well. So that's the first very obvious example of a market inefficiency. Let's get on to the next one. So the next uh, slightly less obvious example, which is frankly still pretty obvious, is something called a net net stock. And this is really the type of investment that Benjamin Graham really made his investment career out of. And basically what it is, as it's looking at the balance sheet of a company, so what assets do they own, uh, you know, how much cash do they have in the bank, what sort of equipment do they own, um, versus what liabilities do they have. So do they um, owe money to anyone, do they have debt, um, all these sorts of things, and you can come up with uh, an overall book value or net worth or equity or whatever you want to call it for that particular business. Um, and Ben Graham basically was finding companies where they were trading in the market at a substantial discount to the equity. He could then go in, break up the company, sell off all the bits and pieces and make a profit by basically closing down the business. So that again is a very obvious example of a market inefficiency. Those businesses were clearly worth more than um, well, they were at the very least worth the scrap value of all the pieces of the business. Um, and many of them were likely worth a lot more than that. So the fact that those stocks even exist uh, or existed, a lot of them, a lot less of them are around today. Um, but the fact that those stocks even existed is just incredibly like crazy to me <laughs> that, that those were around. And you even had some examples where you could buy stocks for less than just the cash they had in their, in their bank accounts. And, um, you know, Ben Graham would li literally go to the shareholders meetings, uh, buy enough of the company to get a seat on the board, this sort of activist type style in investing. Um, and he would get these companies to pay out dividends and offload the unnecessary cash that they had sitting on their books. And this was a great way that uh, Ben Graham was originally able to take advantage of some of these inefficiencies. So 
That's our second example is net net stocks. The fact that these things even exist makes absolutely no sense and it's a very clear example where, uh, of where markets are not pricing assets appropriately. Okay, let's get into some less obvious but still um, fairly clear examples. Um, so the next one I have is a company called Ipsco. This was an investment uh, made by Monus Pabrai in the early 2000s. And long story short, this company basically had locked in contracts to sell the tubular steel that they were manufacturing at the time um, to their customers. They had um, basically all of their production sold already for the next three years. They also had fairly well-known costs and they basically said, uh, came out and said, we have uh, $15 in the bank right now with no debt. Um, this is $15 per share. We're going to earn $15 per share next year and we're gonna earn $15 per share uh, the year after that. So if we fast forward uh, two years, they're gonna go from having $15 a share in the bank to $45 a share in the bank. Um, and the stock at the time was, uh, was trading at $45 per share. So um, you basically have, you know, as close to guaranteed income as you can get in this business and uh, the market was discounting that massively. Um, what ended up happening is that did get priced appropriately eventually um, and I'll put up a, a chart of the stock here. Ipsco eventually got bought out at like $130, $140 a share so it was um, close to a 3x for investors that recognized that inefficiency at the time. The next example we have is one of the less obvious ones. Now, uh, this is also a Monus Pabrai investment that uh, I will be running you through. So uh, this is the intertwining of uh, two companies actually. So they're now two companies. At the time of, of investment, they were one. Um, and this is Fiat Chrysler and Ferrari. Now, if we go back to around 2016, the market cap of Fiat Chrysler was about 15 or 16 billion euros and uh, within that 15 or 16 billion euros was the entire business of Ferrari. Now um, Ferrari eventually got spun out into a separate company, uh, the shareholders of Fiat Chrysler got shares in Ferrari so they still owned the business, uh, it was simply split into two different stocks um, and the management team sort of went their own way and were able to, to operate their own businesses uh, and if we fast forward to today um, we have uh, Ferrari now valued, I'll put the exact numbers <laughs> up on the screen here, uh, but we now have Ferrari valued at more than Fair Chrysler. Uh, the entire remainder of the company was valued for back in 2016. So I think it's north of $20 billion now or 20 billion euros. Um, and that was kind of within Fair Chrysler, which was trading at $16 billion dollars. Uh, 16 billion euros or so uh, at the time. So um, that basically said that all the other brands that Fiat Chrysler owns like Jeep, Maserati, Ram trucks uh, and Fiat and Chrysler themselves um, have basically no value. Um, you're essentially getting all of those for free and you can buy a Ferrari um, at this nice cheap price. So um, again, a very clear example of a market inefficiency and one that uh, actually quite a number of value investors took advantage of in the end. It's an investment that Guy Spear still owns, both Fiat Chrysler and Ferrari. Most providers since sold both of them, uh, but nonetheless, large returns were made on that one. So our next one is Microsoft. Now, uh, this is actually going to be uh, going back in time a little bit to basically the tech bubble and uh, the fact that it's now called a bubble is a clear example of a market inefficiency. Um, back in 2000, Microsoft were trading at a market cap of $600 billion, uh, 0.6 of a trillion dollars. Very, very large market cap, um, but they were actually one of the few companies in the tech bubble that were actually profitable and producing cash flow. Um, the trouble is they were producing nowhere near enough cash flow to justify a $600 billion valuation. Um, they were producing something in the ballpark of eight or $10 uh, billion dollars per year. So they were trading at something like 60 times earnings. And when, you and when you buy a company for 60 times earnings, even if it's really high quality and even if it continues to grow, that tends to result in fairly low returns moving forward. So if I put up a very long-term stock chart here of Microsoft, you'll see that they're now trading at a little over a trillion dollars. Uh, so it's been roughly a double since the year 2000. Uh, 20 years to, to have a double 
if we use the rule of 72, so 72 divided by 20, um, we get approximately three. So that stock has returned only 3% per year, uh, where the underlying business in the meantime though has done phenomenally well, continued to grow, continued to produce more and more cash, uh, but the returns for the investors just haven't been there because they overpaid for the business up front. Again, a good example of a market inefficiency, unfortunately this time not in the favor of investors, or at least long-term investors that are just straight up purchasing the shares. Um, but again, a good example of an inefficiency that happens in the stock market. Now our final example of uh, a clear inefficiency in pricing is actually one that's going on right now. And these are not stock tips. Um, I'm not telling you to, not telling you to short one of these companies or go long one of these companies or anything like that. I think it's just a very interesting example and this um, is actually another Monash Propai example um, that was brought up just in the last month or so. Now, um, this is going to be a comparison of two companies whose business models have been um, affected in very different ways through what's recently gone on worldwide. So, uh, the first company is Live Nation. Now, this is a business that uh, owns Ticketmaster and basically runs concerts and, and sells tickets to concerts. Um, this is a business right now that has obviously been hit very, very hard because people aren't going to concerts. Uh, this is a business where revenues are probably as close to zero as they will ever be. Uh, that is not earnings being close to zero. Uh, it's not that they're bringing in money and not uh, keeping any of it because they're paying out expenses. It's they're literally not even bringing in any money. <laughs> they are going to be burning cash at a stupendous rate and we're likely to see that in their you know second quarter earnings from this year when those do come out. Um, and peak to trough, the stock was down roughly 40%. Um, uh, if we fast forward to today, peak to trough, the stock is down about 25%. It's come back up a little bit. Now, this is a business that has been absolutely, completely just crushed. Um, it may well survive into the future. I'm not going to make a call on that in this video. But the business has been like absolutely destroyed. Um, I don't know the stronger words to use than that. Um, and yet the stock's only down 25%. It just seems absolutely crazy to me. Um, so now let's compare that to a very different business who has actually, if anything, benefited from the um, you know recent crisis that's happened. Now, that is a business called Carriage Services. Now, Carriage Services, if you've never heard of them, uh, basically run funerals. They uh, sort of a conglomerate of many, many, many different uh, funeral homes all around the US and uh, you could make a very strong argument that their business over the last few months, um, if anything, has improved. Um, funeral homes have the lowest rate of bankruptcy of just about any business and they have the most consistent cash flows of pretty much any business. And uh, if you compare what the stock price is doing to again what we just said about the underlying business, uh, this company was also peaked to trough down around 40% and um, from uh, peak to today it's down around 20%. So Live Nation been absolutely crushed down 40%, now only down 25. Carriage services unaffected, if not doing slightly better. Um, down 40%, also now down about 20%. This is a very, very clear example to me of just ridiculous pricing that makes absolutely no sense. Um, and it's a good example again of uh, markets that just are not efficient. So I think by and large, things are priced fairly close to their value most of the time, but uh, every now and then we can get some absolute craziness happening um, and it can you know, create opportunities for investors that are really paying attention to the underlying value of businesses. So hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, if you did, please hit like, hit subscribe. If you're interested in that hash, hatch offer uh, and getting basically your free $20 if you deposit $100 in your account, uh, head to the link hatch.as forward slash investing with Tom. It will be linked uh, down in the description and I'll put a pinned comment uh, in the comment section for you as well. So hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, hit like, hit subscribe and I will see you in the next one. Cheers.